you know, it, as you learned this morning, that it's from atherosclerotic plaque formation and subsequent rupture of uh, clot formation. Um, it, you guys, did you guys go over all this this morning? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's that's true. True. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, or did you guys go over white and red thrombi and all that stuff? No, I mean, it's kind of, it, you know, it's not necessarily anything super important or fancy. I don't know if you're ever going to see it. White thrombi are mostly composed of platelets and plaques. Red are composed of platelets, fibrin, and red blood cells. And I have a little chart here that kind of talks about um, uh, the different types of where you're going to see them in unstable angina versus the STEMI or STEMI. Is it really important that you have, that you know, wipers or anything? No, I honestly don't need to know why in there. So, uh, white thrombus formation, that's the plaque formation, and then you have your red thrombus, which is your fiber and red blood cells as it starts to include the cloth, right? So, all, all this really coming together. All right, risk factors um, here. Did you guys go over risk factors? Yeah. Okay. These are really important here. Um, you know, there's obviously risk factors for a lot of things in medicine. Um, but as far as a risk stratification, uh, which is what, I mean, which is basically what we do in the emergency department about 40% of the time when it comes to a chest pain is risk stratified by somebody. Um, uh, what's going on with them, these uh, risk factors, age, sex, uh, family history, genetic type, uh, diet, exercise, smoking, whether they're diabetic or hypertensive, there's a big difference between somebody in here who has chest pain who has no significant past medical history and then somebody who, you know, is a hypertensive diabetic with high cholesterol who drinks a pint a day and smokes three packs of cigarettes. You obviously can tell that that person's going to be at higher risk for um, coronary artery disease. Okay, wow, well, that was quick. Four minutes, awesome. Okay, uh, lab medicine, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, cardiac biomarkers. You guys talked about that at all in pathophys? Good. Uh, cardiac injury leads to cellular disruption and loss of intracellular components. And these intracellular components are ter termed biomarkers, cardiac biomarkers and uh, the basis for uh, a diagnosis in the emergency department. A uh, little tidbit, um, there are cardiac biomarkers, not cardiac enzymes, because they're not enzymes. They have nothing to do to catalyze the process, but you're gonna see and hear people say, get cardiac enzymes. And so just know that cardiac enzymes and cardiac biomarkers are, if that's a ubiquitous term, it means the same thing, but technically they're not enzymes. I think I told you something in my last lecture about a misnomer on a naming system. Oh, stridulous breathing and not stridorous. This is another like little thing. It means the same thing. Everybody's going to say the same thing. If your uh, attending says cardiac enzymes, don't sell. Then, Excuse me, sir. It's actually cardiac biomarkers. I would recommend doing that. <laughs> but you can think it in your head and just know like, uh, it's biomarkers. Just don't say it out loud. <laughs> okay, uh, for this lecture we're going to talk about troponin, CK, CK and a mild low one. I'm not going to talk about um, uh, B-type or brain atriotic peptide. That's going to be something you're going to discuss in your congestive heart failure uh, lecture. Um, and honestly, we're going to talk about troponin the most because those bottom three are practically worthless and I'll talk to you about why they are. Okay, so troponin. It's an important regulatory component in cardiac muscle. It is the most specific and sensitive biomarker in your uh, cardiac tissue as far as uh, determining whether it's just from the heart. Um, now it has very good sensitivity and specificity, like I said. So if negative, that it's likely not there. And positive means that they likely have the disease. But that positive, that positive factor there is, is, is going to be a little tricky as you start to progress in medicine and learn that there are a lot of different things that can cause an elevated troponin in the absence of ACS. And uh, you know I can give probably a whole lecture on the different things that can cause a positive troponin in people that aren't really having acute coronary syndrome or a heart attack, uh, sepsis kidney disease, things like that. Troponin is metabolized and excreted in the kidneys 
somebody who has chronic kidney disease and has a poor GFR and can have an abnormally elevated troponin level <coughs> at baseline because they can't get rid of it. Um, stress and myocardial ischemia um, from sepsis and things like that can also cause an elevated in troponin um, in the absence of um, acute coronary syndrome. But if it's negative, it's very specific, meaning that if it's negative, it's not there at certain time frames. So proton T, troponin I, they're different variations of the same thing, just affects the reference ranges. You need to very be very sure on the lab that you're working at or where you're working at is where the reference ranges are. We have different ranges for different types of troponin, uh, T's and I's, and whether or not um, you have a highly sensitive or an ultra sensitive troponin assay is also important to know because that affects your timing as well. Um, so this is your typical standard troponin time to rise peak and normalization that you're going to see in a lot of the textbooks and I, you know, I, I have nothing to do with writing the pants, but I would assume it has something that, that's probably close to what you're going to see right there, even though um, that that's a little bit behind in what modern laboratory technology is coming up for. So time to rise, three to six hours. <coughs> time to peak is 12 hours. That 12 hours is going to be a very important number to memorize. And then time to normalization is 10 days. Uh, that's also going to be important as well. Uh, be sure to monitor the delta, if negative or mildly positive. So delta change, uh, you can uh, get your baseline troponin and then wait 90 to 120 minutes. Some people say three hours, um, and then get another troponin and see if there is an increasing. Because you got to see that that time to rise three to six hours is that timing is really important on when people present and how long they've had that chest pain to when you suspect that that troponin can be bumped. Um, you're going to have somebody to come in with chest pain that just started an hour ago and you get a troponin that's negative. That does not mean that they are not having a myocardial infarction. That just means that it hasn't had enough time for the troponin to uh, elevate. Yes, ma'am? What do you mean when you say delta? To change. change. Just to change. Yeah. To start, it's that first, second one, that, that change in them. And there, you know, and it's, it, can, it can be variable, so there's going to be a big difference between having a 0 0.04 as your initial troponin, repeat in two hours and it's 0 0.05, that's really not that big a deal, versus repeating two hours and it's 0 0.25, you know what I mean? That would be a larger delta change, and so that would be more significant. Yes, ma'am? What are normal levels of this? Uh, like I said, that all depends on what lab you're running. They vary wildly compared to what lab assay you're doing. That's why I didn't put them in there. Um, hopefully on your exams or whatever like that, they're going to give you normal values for whatever is in there. In my hospital, normal values is anything from 0.01 to 0.03. So anything over 0.04 is positive. At OU, anything over 0.1 is positive. Anything under 0.1 is negative but we run two different types of troponin assays. Same thing at the heart hospital is a little bit different, so it all just depends on uh, Mercy. We, in Logan County, we have the ability, we run a uh, highly sensitive troponin uh, assay, so our detectable levels are very small compared to um, other hospitals. Good questions. So this right here, um, is a very good uh, graph that kind of talks about, that looks at your peak in troponins versus uh, what uh, assay you're running. So you can see that 1.5 nanograms per milliliter versus all the way down to the 0 0.04. So that 0 0.04 is what I'm working with. That's a highly sensitive uh, troponin assay. So you can see that you're going to see, not necessarily the peak, but you're going to see a little bit of a rise much earlier in your uh, ischemic event than you will um, the other uh, non-high sensitive. And uh, the F in Europe right now, I don't know why, sometimes the United States is so backwards. 
Um, in Europe right now, they're running ultra high sensitive troponin assays that are even quicker or show detect even smaller amounts of troponin um, than the highly sensitive assay. So that just further helps get your uh, troponin values back faster in determining whether or not somebody's having an ischemic event. Uh, something really important to, to notice here, though, is so you have this relatively uh, quick, I mean, 12 hours, depending on you say, I'm having a heart attack for 12 hours, I think I want to know a little bit sooner than that, but relatively quick biomarker accumulation, but see how it takes so much, so much longer, sorry, uh, for it to drop off. I mean, that says about five to six days back down to normal. Some textbooks say 10 days. I mean, it's it, it, a good thing to remember is it's multiple days. And so from an emergency medicine standpoint, that doesn't really mean a whole lot to me because they're not going to be in my ER for days. But from a hospitalist or a cardiology standpoint, it's difficult to track and trend troponins after somebody has an ischemic event because those troponins stay elevated for days after. And so that's when we're going to go to different labs here. We're going to talk about myoglobin uh, that I think is a little bit better for tracking uh, re-infarction. So you admit somebody to the hospital, they had an instantly, they had a big bump of troponin, you did whatever to them, they're in the hospital on their second and third day. Now they're saying, oh my god, my chest is killing me, it's just like it was before. You get a troponin and it's still elevated. Well, is it still elevated because it just hasn't cleared yet, or is it elevated because they're having another infarction? That's, that's the difficulty with it because it lasts so long, so that's why we use uh, other ones that we're going to talk about here in a second. Okay, so 12 hours is the magic number here. 12 hours is going to be your test question. If your troponin is negative after 12 hours, I mean that essentially rules out acute coronary syndrome. And I use that 12 hour mark a lot. Now when I say essentially, I mean that you know you can always I always put essentially or probably or a lot of things in my notes because there is no 100% medicine at all. But I think 99% of the time if your troponin is negative after 12 hours, that essentially rules out acute coronary syndrome. There are a lot of other things that can cause acute chest pain in a person, but that 12 hour uh, marker is important. Okay. CK, uh, creatine phosphokinase, found in skeletal muscle, heart, brain. Uh, it lacks, uh, it's found everywhere. It can be elevated for a lot of different things. Uh, multiple factors influence, influence its rise from kidneys to muscle tissue breakdown. It's, it's worthless. I mean, here, look at the timing if you want it. It's, it's worthless. Don't even run it. I don't even think we, we run CKs at our lab just by virtue because we need to be able to test for rhabdo. But CK is done. Back whenever I first got into medicine slash nursing in 2008, um, they were we were doing um, uh, chest pain profiles was a lab that we ran a lot, and that included troponin, myoglobin, CK, and CK and B. So. Uh, back then, it was still fairly normal to kind of give all those cardiac enzymes all at once. Nowadays, it, troponin is it. You don't need to run anything else. CKMB, it's antiquated as well. We don't even run CKMB in our lab at Mercy, period. The entire Mercy lab across the entire state of Oklahoma, and I'm pretty sure probably across uh, the whole network, which includes St. Louis, Arkansas, Texas. Uh, they took CKMB out of our lab because it's it's worthless. It's not a, it's it's a test that is positive for some things, negative for some things. It's not specific enough. Troponins have advanced enough in laboratory medicine to become highly sensitive and specific that you don't really use CKMB anymore. I have some stuff in the lecture notes, uh, in the handout notes, if you guys want to read about it. I think, but uh, CK and CKMB aren't used anymore. Myoglobin, I don't use myoglobin at all from an emergency department standpoint, but I think looking at the research that it, uh, it you'd have probably have to talk to a cardiologist next time he comes up here, because uh, I don't do inpatient cardiology, but I would assume that it has some value as far as monitoring uh, those post MI patients because of its time of normalization. It's like 24 to 36 hours. It will filter and go back down to normal. 
And so you can see um, that rise again uh, for that reembarkation, or somebody's having another ischemic event. Uh, that would be some utility. And if you look at the time to rise two to four hours, that's typically a lot faster than your highly sensitive and even ultra sensitive troponins. But it's so nonspecific, it, you can't say, you can't take somebody to the cath lab just because they have an elevated myoclobin. There are a lot of different things that can cause muscle tissue breakdown to have uh, those elevated numbers in there. So that's why it's kind of gone out of favor, is that it's nonspecific and we have labs now that are specific to it. Does all that make sense? Mm -hmm. So here's another uh, little handout here. Uh, it talks about the timing and infarction rates and uh, as you go through. Uh, but again, the magic number 12 on troponin, I think, for test questions. Uh, knowing when, you know, it's, it's hard to give you an exact figure to when you're going to see an elevated troponin because it all depends on what type of uh, assay you're running. Um, and it's hard to give you an actual number because it all depends on what type of assay you're running. But just know that troponins are the most highly sensitive and specific ones, and that 12-hour number is typically your good cutoff. After 12 hours, they're likely not having ACS. Now, as you guys know, and I mean, as you start to progress through this module, there's a lot of different things that can cause chest pain other than acute coronary syndrome. So just because somebody's troponin is negative doesn't mean you necessarily need to blow them off. Say, so, well, go home. Your thing's fine. Okay. Uh, is everybody good on that? Yes. Okay. I mean, pretty simple stuff. EKG. Uh, you guys already talked a lot about EKG, I assume, in your previous lectures. Um, there's nothing super fancy in this lecture about this. Uh, it's gold standard in evaluation of chest pain. If you don't get an EKG, you're going to get deemed. There's a bunch of CMS. Um, uh, regulations and criteria, or core measures, excuse me, core measures, uh, you have to have an EKG within 10 minutes to the arrival of an emergency department with a complaint of chest pain. So when you get your coders in there, you know, everything now that's electronic is time stamped and correlated. So your coders will come in there and they'll ding you on the CMS core measures if you don't get an EKG within 10 minutes of arrival to an emergency department. So a lot of a lot of the larger emergency departments like OU, Southwest, Baptist, that presents a little bit of a problem because they can have 20 people in their waiting room and stacks of people that you know haven't even been triaged yet by a nurse, let alone even seen by a physician. So typically they have one or two EKG machines up there in triage, and as soon as somebody comes in with chest pain, they slap an EKG on them before they're even doing their. Uh, their uh, so, uh, cheap, easy, fast, non-invasive. It's easy to interpret as you start to... <laughs> as, you, as you start to read more of them and knowing what you're looking for. And I think as you start to know when to trust the computer and when not to trust the computer, is I think a little bit different. The computer does a lot of amazing things on calculating values for you that I think are very important, but as far as your overall interpretation of it, obviously I hope that whoever taught you EKG said to don't listen to the computer because it'll fool you a lot of times. They actually just did a study I was reading about in a blog the other day um, that it was they uh, tested a computer versus a bunch of board certified cardiologists and the computer was wrong like 25% of the time on its initial diagnosis of what rhythm that it was or whatever it was. Um, and it happens, I've had, I've had some computer printouts that said this was an active STEMI and I'm like, no it's not. And then I've had some that said it was normal and I was like, no that's a STEMI. So you know, it's, it's difficult to, you have to, EKG is one of those things you have to read, you know, and it just takes time. I mean, I, I swear I order probably about 10 or 15 a day sometimes, and so it's like every day I work just constantly reading, reading those, and so you get a little bit easier about it. Um, but I guess the point I was trying to make there, cheap, easy, fast, non-invasive, why would you not do one? If like any reason that you think you might get an EKG, just do it. The, pro the biggest kickback you're going to get is your nurses. Because um, it takes them a lot of times to strip the patient down, put the stickers on them, hook all the leads up, enter the information into the EKG machine, print it out, 
you know, if they're shaking or combative or whatever, it's going to give you a bunch of artifact and stuff, and so they, they're going to fight you on that a lot. But just do it. It's so, it's, I think it costs eight bucks, like eight dollars for an EKG, and it's easily interpreted. And so, if, I mean, I guess uh, words of wisdom or advice that I could ever pass on is if you think somebody needs an EKG, just get one. If you get a weird feeling in your body, just get one. Yeah, anyway, yeah, I mean, uh, I, you know, uh, for anybody that comes in with chest pain, they get an EKG and a chest x-ray, no matter what their age is. I you know cardiac biomarkers and the labs and all that other stuff, that can be a little bit different. But there are plenty of disease processes that can cause chest pain in any age. Now, I don't really know about infants and like, you know, newborns and stuff like that. Um, and it's, you're not going to have a two-year-old that can't talk come up there saying that my chest hurts. <laughs> but if a, a child is old enough to, dis, to relate to his parents or relate to you that my chest hurts, get an EKG and chest x-ray. Because um, there's all sorts of... Now, are you expecting that five-year-old toddler or whatever to be having acute coronary syndrome? No. Are you, may, are you looking for like a cardiac tachyarrhythmia, like an SVT or PSVT or VPAC or whatever underlying arrhythmia? Yes, that's what you're looking for. Um, so I mean, that's obviously another lecture, but going back to my original statement, get an EKG. Uh, did you guys go over this right here about what leads mean what? Good. Go that. You guys saw that right there. Just memorize that. Look at it and memorize it. That's like that's how I look at an EKG whenever I look at one. Like whenever I whenever I look at EKG, like I see those boxes. They just always come up in my head. Just remember those boxes. Are they super important for you to remember? Or are you going to get nailed to the wall if you don't know them? No. But just it's it's better just to know them. You guys already know about that. You guys know about at elevation, depression, one millimeters, all that junk? No, yeah. over that. That's a little bit different. This is clinical now, so this is okay. totally different than the way Vanette is teaching you. Okay, yeah, so uh, here your, um, where's our little pointer thing at? Yeah. The stick. Yeah, Long the stick. stick. Red yeah. On the stick. There you are. Um, so, you have your isoelectric line here, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so you're looking for elevation from that ST segment above your isoelectric line. One millimeter is typically your go-to. It needs to be over one millimeter. So you're looking at, I guess, two millimeters or higher. I mean, I guess I would say so. If it's one millimeter, Above the isoelectric line, okay. Over one millimeter, not okay, right? Um, and those uh, <laughs> trying to find that isoelectric line on somebody who's moving around, there's a lot of artifact, can be a little difficult sometimes. I don't know if I've ever seen any EKG that looks that beautiful. Um, so, but uh, so obviously this would be your ST segment elevation here. You have some ST depression uh, here. Um, so finding that isoelectric line, trying to count your boxes. Okay, uh, here uh, we have some T-wave conversion, which is indicative of ischemia. You guys uh, see a lot of head shaking, which is good. So that flipped T-wave. Now in which uh, EKG lead is that okay in? Okay. If it's isolated, okay. Oh, uh, one of them. Uh, I need to actually look at the EKG. One of them, uh, it's it's flipped normally. I think AFR. You're right. The one that's right next to one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there you go. I don't know. I can't remember which one the AFR is in, but it's like right, right next to one. Uh, yeah, that's normal. Um, I guess I guess a better question would be. If it's flipped and isolated in the sleeve, it's not a big deal. Sometimes it's flipped, sometimes it's not. Oh, 
Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with V1, but you guys are all saying it with authority, so I'm just going to say, okay. But <laughs> uh, flip T in 3 is free. Flip T in 3 is free. That's a freebie. Isolated T wave inversion in lead 3 is okay. Normal variant. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Do you look at AFR when we were told to just completely ignore that box? ABR. Wait, wait. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, don't do that. <laughs> um, this is a little bit more advanced diagnostic EKG. That's why I don't include it in this. A isolated ST segment elevation in AFR is very correlated with uh, myocardial ischemia and infarction. Right coronary, uh, right coronary artery disease, I think, is what AFR isolated ST segment elevation. So I'll uh, I'll email you this paper if you guys are interested. Uh, whenever I'm done here, um, it's uh, commonly missed. And tricky EKG. I don't know if that's the exact title of the paper, but it's kind of like all the different little commonly missed EKG changes for ischemia and event. And I think that's actually number one. Is, is isolated ST segment in AVR. And that was where? A AVR. No, but what part of the heart are you saying? Is that right? I think it's right, but I could be wrong. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. I could. I could be wrong. Don't. Don't write that down. Let me let me look at that paper just to be sure. I'm going to tell you guys wrong, but uh, the isolated ABR is indicative of disease in a certain part of the heart. But off the top of my head, I cannot remember right now. But yeah, don't don't uh, don't, don't dismiss it. Don't dismiss anything. I guess. The T wave inversion in three is free. It's free. Free. Flip T in three is free if it's isolated. If it's isolated. Three only. Now I didn't say flip T in three, two, and ABF is free. No, I said flip T in three is free. Isolated only. Right? If you have those flip T waves in those inferior leads, then that's not a good deal. Right? But if you see a flip T in three only, not a big deal. Uh, did you guys talk about left bundle branch blocks? Yes. Yeah, so new onset left bundle branch block is so a MI unless proven otherwise, correct? <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry. What? Uh, new onset left bundle branch block is a um, new MI until proven otherwise. Very correlated with. Now, People will have a chronic reoccurrent left front of branch block, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're having a myocardial infarction. In fact, I dismiss that all the time because it's a chronic thing that they have. But that's why you need to have multiple EK, multiple old EKGs to compare them to uh, to be able to say that, oh, that left front of branch block is not new. That's a chronic finding. So, Do they uh, have to be symptomatic? I'm sorry? Do they need to be symptomatic for that to qualify? I don't think that they need to be symptomatic. I mean, I would think that they, if it's new, it needs to be investigated. But I think that if they, if they have a new onset left front branch block, I, I, guess, I guess that's a tricky question because I don't know why you would be getting an EKG if they weren't somewhat symptomatic, if that wasn't ticking your brain, unless you're just kind of shot running everybody. So if you order the EKG, something in your brain said that, oh, this might be a subtle MI or something weird, and then you see a new onset left front of branch block, that should, even with negative troponins, you know, unless they've been having chest pain for three or four days, and they have negative troponin, then I still think it needs to be investigated, or at least talk to a cardiologist about it. Yes, sir. Uh, so how we were taught was that for a left bundle branch block, there should be an RS, R prime, and V6, I think. Yeah. Why isn't it there in your V6 on the bottom left? It's in one, but I didn't think that was. I don't think we learned it like that. Am I wrong? The RS, R prime, needs to be in one. In no less. 
Uh, I'm trying to think back of where I pulled this lecture, this slide from. I made this lecture like three years ago. I don't know why. We told if it's in V1 is a right above branch plot, and V6 would be left. But I don't remember anything about lead one. Uh, yeah, well, take... yeah. I guess I misunderstood your question. No, so in that one, there is RSR prime in V1, and on the left, I would expect it to see it in V6. Oh, you're saying about right here? Correct. RSR prime? Yeah. Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Let me, let me look that up and see where I pulled that from, and then I can email you guys back on it. Okay. Yeah. Um, for the new onset of a left level ball branch synonymous with the QMI, if you don't have a previous one to look at, can you not make that call? Uh, you can't, it's not like that you can't make that call. I would still be, how much, I'm trying to word this for you. If you have a EKG that shows a left burner branch block and you don't have an EKG to compare it to to say that that is old, I would assume that that's new. Okay. It, yeah, it, it all points. Unless you have an old EKG or even multiple old EKGs to show that that left runner branch block is old or chronic or reoccurring, then just assume that every new left runner branch block you have or every left runner branch block you see is new and is going to be synonymous with the MI. Especially if your patient is now heard or doesn't know what sure. you're talking yeah. about. That would be a good indicator. And it, it, and it becomes very difficult too whenever you have people that are bouncing around different institutions and you can't see their old yeah. stuff. You know, people are dumb too. I just don't know about this stuff. I have a question. Yes. So if you saw this, would there be anything else on the EKG that may um, indicate an acute MI? Absolutely. I so mean, T wave inversions or ST segment okay. elevation or, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. It's not going to be just one or the other. A lot of times you'll see, I mean, even when you have ST segment elevation, you still want to look for reciprocal changes. I think that we have. I'll add this in next year. You look for reciprocal changes in your EKGs, such as T wave inversions or ST segment depression in other leads. That's even, I mean, that's even more of like a slam dunk. When you start seeing a STEMI, that's pretty much slam dunk anyways, if it's like your big tombstone looking pattern. Um, if you see some that's kind of more mild, come on in. Um, if you see some that's kind of more mild, um, or questionable, you're looking for your reciprocal changes in other leads, and then when you see those, that even kind of rings your bell even harder. Good questions. I'll I will get what I need to start making notes on what I need to email you guys. What did I tell you I was going to email you before? Something about having cases. Yeah. 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 We miss DKG. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll actually be able to send it to you. Uh, Preview. Oh, was there? Was there? Mm -hmm. finding. More specific about left front or branch block. Okay. Yeah, and we're learning like what we're going through now. Yeah, so that's, that's going to be in the EKG yeah. funky findings. Yeah. I was going to say, what we're doing now is like interpreting, not diagnostic. So if it's just different in that scenario, then like it's not a big deal as far as more clarification. But if you're, he taught us that, it should be in V6. So. Sure. We will get back to you. I am by no means an uh, EKG interpretation expert, but I will be some information. Yes, ma'am. So, um, I think where the confusion is coming from is our coordinator is teaching us that you're supposed to spend many years in B6. And it's not going to be the case at all times. You just really have to focus on the QRS complex, which is larger than 0.12. You're going to most likely see those mountain tops when it's a left bundle branch block. But when it's right, which is rare, it's not rare, but you'll see left a lot. But it's really just the wideness of the QRS. You're not always going to see that inverted line of your blood. If that's what you're looking for. If that's what you, if that's what you're confusing you guys is the... There's a lot of different... It's not going to always look like right. what he drew with the bunny ears. Right. Like There's not every... Yeah. It's going to look like a mountain top like that, but... I've seen a lot of right bunner black blocks that they're just wide, but there's no like... Sure. There, I, I, whenever I, what I'm going to send you is going to be the, all the diagnostic criteria for the right and left right branch block, and there's a lot of different ones. There's a lot of different, you know, leaning L, bunny ears, 
different segments, RSR prime, there's going to be a lot of different criteria for diagnosis. And it's not just one. It's not like one gold standard. You're going to see this and that equals that. It's going to be a bunch of different things. And that, thankfully, uh, is what the computer does really well because it analyzes those segments and measures all of that really closely. And so I think that uh, front and range blocks from a computer standpoint is pretty good. Yes, ma'am. Last question about this. Sorry. You're fine. I read something about determining if it's a complete or a partial. Sure, like a left hemivesicular block or a right hemivesicular block. Can you, like, kind of. Because I, what I saw, and I don't know if it was like a blog or something, um, was that if you have the, the hot people, I don't know. It was in like one of those student docs. Can I talk know. to you more about that? Yeah, I mean. It, yeah, if it's in one, see how yours says like in one, that's indicative, or one uh -huh. in A, B, F, that's indicative of a complete. If you see it in one, A, B, F, and B, one, and B, six. That's something I'm going to have to look up. I don't have it all in my head. But there are. Sure, yeah. Partial or is sure. It there, uh, we'll give you some more information sending on that. There are differences because if you look at the bundle of bundle his branches and all the different things that you can have, the specific blocks on where it goes down is determined on that. Yeah, there can be a bunch of like hemi fascicular so blocks. So if it's a partial, it's a hemi then? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that makes more sense then. Yeah. And then when yeah when then it's complete it's complete and you can have blocks in different segments. I'll, I'm glad you guys are all talking about this because I'm going to add this. Not that it's going to do you guys any good. <laughs> I'll add it to next year's lecture slides to make sure that we fully cover this a little bit. Because I guess I wasn't understanding that whenever you guys are doing EKGs that it's not necessarily a diagnostic EKG. You're more learning just the basic um, morphology of it. So I will go into more detail on EKGs next year, and I will be sure to send you out. Um, more information on this uh, in the coming days, so that you guys have the information. Uh, any more questions over this? In the clearest mind? Yeah. Um, pathological Q waves here. This is going to be, mm, excuse me, that negatively deflected arsenic here, and that is uh, indicative of old myocardial infarctions. So you'll see those a lot in people that have had previous MIs or even people that don't even know that they had in mice but have that pathological uh, downward negatively deflecting uh, wave there, uh, Q wave, that, that's termed Q wave. Um, Again, update, this is what Dr. Vanetta is talking about is the very first deflection and the measurement. Notice he's making sure that you're hearing pathological Q wave. So pathological Q wave is going to be in your mind what you would look more clinically for old. Mm -hmm. And that is correlating with what Dr. Vanetta is talking about. Again, you don't have to have the pathological Q wave right. for an acute MI. Absolutely. Well, you wouldn't see it with acute because this is from buildup of scar tissue that, exactly. that uh, causes abnormal electricity transaction through your heart. Um, so this is uh, indicative of old MIs. But these are helpful whenever people come in with chest pain and say, oh yeah, I've never seen cardiologists before, I've never had a heart attack, I have no problems. And then you see these pathological Q waves all over their EKGs like, uh, you've had something, but you just didn't know about it. Um, and so that kind of lends more credence uh, to it. All right. Radiology and special tests. So PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, that's kind of an umbrella term, catch-all for your angioplasty, balloon angioplasty, or radiography. Um, anytime you're accessing a vein percutaneously and injecting dye or putting in stents or whatever, that's basically what you're doing right there. Uh, gold treatment. Or gold standard treatment and the treatment of STEMI and NSEMI, more in the STEMI. Uh, sorry, more in the NSEMI. Uh, STEMI can be treated in a variety of different ways, uh, whether it's PCI or um, um, clot busting medicine, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, and this also can be used to evaluate the presence of blockages 
and the need to revascularize the ischemic vessels. So a lot of times you're going to be um, performing uh, coronary arteriography or angiography, just looking for the blockages, and then they decide to go in and do either balloon angioplasty or put a stent in and things like that. So it kind of, they, it, that, that term catches a lot of different things. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, so they do kind of like a uh, cell dinger technique, putting a, a catheter in and snaking up uh, it through your femoral artery. But a lot of times now, that picture is in the femoral, uh, a lot of physicians now are going more towards a radial artery approach. Uh, less invasive, easier to put pressure on um, that radial artery than it is the femoral artery if any kind of bleeding or anything like that happens. So I see more and more um, radial artery approaches than I do femoral artery approaches, but they're still back and forth. I don't, you have to ask a cardiologist on why they decide femoral versus radial. I have no idea uh, but whether they can do both. Uh, so this right here is going to be uh, what you're seeing in the cath lab, the catheter lab, that's what you would call that place that you go to get this done. Uh, so you can see they're injecting uh, this radiopaque dye under uh, continuous fluoroscopy. So it's like a continuous x-ray that instead of just shooting a quick burst, you can keep it on and you can see movement. And they're shooting this dye. And so you can see how it kind of like, I guess, gets blocked right here. And then this is when they revascularize it. Now you can see that it's uh, going back through that dye. And so that's what you're going to see whenever you, uh, if you're ever in the cath lab. PAs, PAs rarely get in the cath lab that much. I mean, you can do it, you can do it as a student, but as a practicing cardiology PA, not a lot of times you're going to be in the cath lab doing procedures because there's really no reason for you to be in there. The interventional cardiologist is going to be doing his work. There's nothing you can really help with other than just kind of sitting there. Um, but if you're looking at cath lab reports or anything like that, uh, that's what you're going to see. So there's a balloon angioplasty with a stent placement. You can see that that stent uh, is over that balloon. They blow it up, bust open all those plaques and thrombus, and then leave that stent that allows blood to flow through the middle. So PCI for STEMI, gold standard, is 90 minutes door to needle time. So that number is important for CMS uh, coding and billing. So as soon as they walk into the emergency department, and that's not even when you see them, that's when they walk in, their time starts and you have 90 minutes to get them to a facility that does PCIs uh, unless you do clot busting medicine, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, the PCI in STEMI is usually done, you know, 24 hours, 12 hours after presentation. There's no real um, acuity uh, to get a uh, angiography or uh, a stent placed on in STEMIs unless they have, you know, sudden deterioration or things like that. If their blood pressure is getting lower or whatever, and they're getting, going into cardiac dysrhythmia, so that's when you want to do it faster. But when you have an in STEMI, you have some time um, for that to have to go to the cath lab. That makes sense. Uh, cardiac stress testing, important diagnostic and prognostic tool. Put them on a treadmill, run an EKG on them, uh, see if they have any stress-induced ischemic changes. Um, sometimes you're just not going to see it on people that have, you know, um, stable angina. So chest pain when they get up and move around, but goes away whenever they rest. Uh, you do these cardiac stress testings. Um, so I think I wrote some indications for <coughs> these testing. This can be done more on a uh, outpatient cardiology standpoint. Um, and so we talk about different types. Exercise, exercise stress tests, put them on a treadmill. Sometimes they put them on a bike and run them around. For the people that are old, arthritic, can't walk, can't run, things like that, you can have a uh, pharmacologic stress testing where they just do uh, the stress test and they give them like a bump of the butyrine and the to make their heart kind of beat a little bit faster, put it under a little bit of stress and look for those ischemic type changes or elevation in cardiac enzymes. 
So yeah, there's a some old dude walking on the treadmill. God, these pictures are so old, but it's so hard to find them. I mean, it's like, anyways. Okay, anybody good on that? I mean, I'm not super kind of harp on any of this stuff like that. But I'm part of the testing, and we'll talk more about our PCIs and stuff uh, as far as treatment goes uh, later on in this lecture. You guys all good with that? So let's go over risk stratification, and I think we'll take our first break. Um, so there's been a lot of studies that, have, I mean, obviously we've been, we've talked about coronary artery disease, and it's been in uh, medicine for a really long time. So there's a lot of studies that we have performed and looked at through research and um, using statistics to help us figure out what risk these people have for these other things. Framingham study is going to be a big one, but that's more on a outpatient um, family practice kind of workup. Uh, heart score and Timmy score are two of the big ones that we use here in the emergency department as far as risk stratification. So, uh, you know, I, I see I see probably ten people with chest pain a day. So that's ninety a month. I don't know, a thousand a year. Do I admit a thousand people for chest pain to my hospital? No. You couldn't. You, if, you, if you admitted every person with chest pain and had them do stress tests or uh, troponin monitoring, things like that, you, you would wear out the whole hospital system just doing that. So who do we send home? How do you, which person do you need to keep? in your hospital and do observation, or who is safe to go home. Now a lot of times, uh, before these tools came out, that was more kind of a uh, clinical gestalt, kind of a gut feeling from whatever the provider was on who was safe to go home, who was uh, needed to be admitted. To me, I use these risks, I think I talked to you guys about risk stratification tools in my previous lecture. Um, but these risk stratification tools are so wonderful because they tell you what to do. I don't want to have to think. You guys are going to realize whenever you start doing this job, you're you having to use your brain all the freaking time and think through complex situations. If there's a time where I don't have to think and somebody tells me what to do, I love that. I just do that. Uh, so the heart score is what I use the best. I mean, this has been validated through research. It's wild, widely accepted. Uh, throughout emergency medicine and cardiology communities, and this is what I use to risk track my patients. So it's actually kind of cool that it's like heart, you know, in the actual, whatever. You guys suck. Um, so age history, highly suspicious, moderate suspicious, slightly suspicious. That's difficult because I think, you know, you can. That's a that's a bit of a subjective thing from the clinician goes. Um, and they're scaled on zero through three, and all this stuff's in your handout, so you don't have to take diligent notes on it. Um, what's the difference between slightly and moderate suspicious? You know, I don't know, you tell me. Whether diaphoretic or vomiting or have crushing substernal chest pain or versus like, eh, it's gonna hurt a little bit, you know. Uh, that's gonna kind of be up to you what you look to. Uh, I mean, highly suspicious, somebody comes in, they're, they're sweating up the storm, they vomited, they have chest pain, it's crushing, I can't breathe, feels like an elephant sitting on my chest, blah, blah, blah. They're saying all the right words, highly suspicious. Uh, EKG, so it's gonna be normal, non-specific changes, or significant ST depression. Why do you think that it doesn't say significant ST elevation? Do what? Because they are automatically. You know, exactly. You don't need to risk stratify those people. They're having a heart attack, man. Get them to the cath lab. They're done. You're done. You don't even have to use this. If they got ST elevation, it's it's over with. Doesn't matter what their labs say. Doesn't matter what their troponin comes back as. That one EKG showing ST elevation, you're done. That's a STEMI. Do you the medicines? Get them out the door, or get them upstairs. Bring them where you work. Uh, age, break it down into age risk categories, which is really nice. Sometimes it sucks because if you use it, you get these 80 year olds that complain chest pain that you know in your mind that it's not really anything, but that gives them a lot of points just because they're older. But you know, like I said, research shows that. And then your risk factors, this is why it was important to know the risk factors here for because it's used in this risk stratification. And then obviously your troponin, your normal versus one to three times normal or three times above normal. 
And so here, what I like about the heart score versus the Timmy score, the Timmy score gives you some risk stratification, excuse me, numbers. But the heart score tells you what to do. The Timmy score does not. Heart score, so 0 to 3, send them home. Less than 1.6% chance of MACE, major adverse cardiac event. Uh, I think it's out to six weeks. Um, 4 to 6, 13%, starting to get up pretty high. Should probably be admitted for observation in serial enzymes. Uh, 7 to 10, it, uh, those people need to go to catalog. So those are the end stimmies that need to get sent over to you know, the heart hospital or need to be admitted to your cardiology floor for a more, I guess, urgent cath lab. You know, and when you look at those things, so 7 to 10, um, to get those numbers, I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer already. You don't really need to risk driving. I mean, they're highly suspicious. They have significant ST depression. They're old as shit. They have a bunch of coronary artery disease classification stuff on them. Their troponins are three times normal. I mean, I would hope you don't need a risk application tool to tell you that those people probably need to have a more urgent intervention. Um, so this is kind of a little more helpful in those like kind of weaker cases to help uh, point you in the right direction. But you know, they get shit. That stuff. I, don't, I, I, I don't know if I've ever had a, a seven to 10 before. I'm sure I have, I just never used the score to actually calculate it up because I didn't need to because it was pretty much slammed up right there. Uh, Timmy score, uh, another risk stratification, categorizes risk of mortality. Uh, it has a lot of, it has more um, segments and points that you can get and then those points obviously added up to percentages, which you, know, you get those percentages there, but there again, it doesn't really tell you what to do with those percentages. So, you know, is 13.2% too high to send home, or is 8.3%? 8.3% sounds kind of high to me. I mean, that's close to 10%, so one in 10 people that you send home is actually going to die from a major cardiac event. It sounds a little bit high. That's why I don't really like the Timmy score, because I feel like it'd be tough, tough to justify that in my brain. You take care of 1,000 patients that have this, you use the Timmy score and send everybody home that's two or lower, that means I've killed 100 people. Mm -hmm. Right? That's kind of scary. So you, you can use it if you want. I mean, I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying I don't like it. OK. Uh, you guys good on this risk stratification tool? Because this is, man, this is so important. And this uses, oh, I use it all the time in clinical practice. And I know. One of, or all of you guys are going to come rotate with me, and I'll be like, what should we use to risk stratify them? And I'm going to get this blank stare, and I'm going to get so mad because I came up here to talk about it. Heart score, remember it. All right? Okay. Do uh, you guys want to take a break, or do you guys want to keep powering through? Okay. Yeah. 